uh, out there on the interwebs. Um, and thank you for joining us for um, this AASA webinar, um, focusing on the impact of online learning and the academic institution. So I just want to go through um, a few of the kind of ground rules before we start, um, and also just to advertise the fact that we will be having one more webinar um, following this one coming up on the 12th of June um, to bring our webinar series uh, to a close, at least for now. Um, and before I forget as well, I just want to thank and acknowledge um, Dr. Mohammed Maki, who has been curating our series for us, and also AASA Secretary at Martha Liu, uh, who's also been helping to administer the series. So thank you very much to both of you. And let's get underway. Um, so I'd like to first introduce our, um, our panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Libby Sander, who's an assistant professor at Bonn University. Um, she teaches in the area of organizational behavior and uh, is an agenda contributor at the World Economic Forum and founder and director of the Future of Work Project. Her research focuses on workplaces, the future of work and its impact on our lives, um, spanning organizational behavior, neuroscience, architecture, psychology, entrepreneurship, and urban design. And she has spoken at TEDx and is a regular guest on TV and radio internationally and writes regularly for the conversation. Following on from Libby, we'll have Dr. Deborah Usher Barnstone, who is a professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, um, where she's course director for undergraduate studies in architecture and associate head of school. Although no expert on the economic impacts of pandemics on universities, beyond her leadership roles at UTS and over 25 years of experience in universities in Australia, the US, Canada, and Europe, Barnstone is the daughter of a distinguished professor who was executive officer at City University of New York Graduate Center for years, wife of an academic, daughter-in-law of another distinguished professor, and sister-in-law to two other full-time academics. So she's inundated with stories about how the crisis is being handled around the world. And then finally, we will uh, conclude today's session with Dr. Neil Selwyn, who's a professor at Monash University in the Faculty of Education. Recent books by Neil include Should Robots Replace Teachers in 2019, and Is Technology Good for Education in 2017? And perhaps that's all you need to know about Neil, at least for now. Okay, so advancing on. So just to lay a few ground rules, um, after this introduction, I just want to you know, lay out that we're gonna have you know, each of the presenters um, talk for about 15 minutes. Um, and during this time, attendee chat will be disabled um, and we will have a Q&A portal if you do have questions. Um, following this, we're gonna have a Q&A session. So hopefully we'll have a good 15 minutes at the end um, where we can discuss and um, you can ask questions and I'll invite all the panelists at that stage uh, to turn on their video and microphones so that we can have a discussion. Um, if we run out of time, um, we can certainly ask your question or answer your questions offline. We'll also be posting a video of today's session um, on the AASA website. So I'd encourage you to go to that site also to access um, the previous recordings um, and also the, uh, the slides for download as well. And so here's the AASA website, and you'll be able to find um, links to that on the homepage and also um, uh, through the various uh, links to the learning resources. And so without further ado, if I can please now turn the screen share and mic over to Dr. Louis Sander. Thanks, Chris. So lovely to be with everybody this afternoon. Uh, some of you, it might be morning. I think someone just uh, shared good morning from London. So thank you for getting up so early and joining us. Um, um, we're all very conscious uh, that we're also at the, probably one of the last things keeping you between uh, Friday afternoon drinks. So uh, as Chris said, we'll make sure that we keep on time and uh, have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'm going to talk this afternoon about maintaining our health and well-being in this online world. And it's been, you know, obviously a huge change in pretty much every aspect of our life. And what's interesting is that, as many of you will all be experts in, our physical space actually acts as a cognitive scaffold. So what happens when the physical space that we're used to doing things in, you know, teaching, having meetings, researching, collaborating, um, becomes a physical, uh, sorry, becomes a virtual space and 
how does that affect our well-being and how do we maintain our well-being mentally and physically in this new virtual world? So we're going to talk about a few different aspects of that and, uh, you know, reflecting on the cognitive scaffolding, uh, you know, the very beautiful uh, reading room from the British Library that's now in the British Museum, uh, which was one of the original co-working spaces. You know, we often think that's a recent invention, but, uh, you know, they've been around since the Enlightenment. So spaces like this help us to think better and feel more inspired and, you know, it probably looks really nice compared to <laughs> where many of us might be working lately. And you might have seen on Twitter some funny memes of people using their fridge as a stand-up desk, uh, laundry baskets or ironing boards as a table. You know, we take for granted that people have a workspace at home and not necessarily everybody does and they certainly don't have a separate office uh, with a door that they can close. And the other thing we're really missing is, you know, that face-to-face -face connection and everything that that gives us and, uh, you know, the community that we feel um, has suddenly been taken away from us. So how can we maintain our physical and mental well-being, you know, during this time? I'm going to talk specifically about um, some psychological and physical uh, benefits and also downsides to using video meeting and, and online teaching, um, but also some broader aspects around that as well. So I don't know if anyone can relate to this uh, at the moment, if they've been feeling that uh, pretty much every day um, feels the same. And perhaps if you're not in a teaching uh, framework at the moment or, or teaching, it could be that you're finding this quite challenging. And uh, one of the things that uh, is important about routine is that they're very much correlated with our productivity and our self-esteem. So regardless if, if we think, oh, I had one of those routines that was you know, down to the minute or, uh, you know, I had a routine that I didn't really think was that important, but all of those little things like getting dressed for work, I don't know if anyone's doing the uh, webinar in their pyjamas, but, uh, you know, having ISO hair, being able to go and get coffee on the way to work, you know, the people we would chat to in the office and those little rituals and routines that we had during the day are actually a really important part of you know, our identity and self-esteem and our productivity. So what's happened uh, in recent weeks and months is that's all been you know, kind of ripped away from us. And many people are experiencing you know, varying levels of you know, unease, discomfort or trauma because so many aspects of our life have actually changed so dramatically. And there's been so much uh, for us to maintain, especially for, for those of you uh, who are teaching and who are working in jobs where we kind of have to look like, let's just carry on and pretend that nothing's happened. And, you know, uh, we've seen all these memes on social media about if, if you aren't sort of writing a novel or learning how to bake sourdough, uh, then, you know, you're kind of really failing during this time as well as do your job and look like you're doing that really well. And uh, I don't know about any of you guys, but um, I certainly haven't had any time to learn any new skills. And of course, we have the stress of even if we aren't worried personally about our own health and well-being, we may be for people that we know, um, we may be worried about our jobs or our financial security uh, and just the situation in its entirety that our normal routines, our normal habits, if it was going to football, if it's uh, being able to go away for the weekend, driving outside of our local area, all of these things have actually changed. So, um, but perhaps some of you will have some good stories in the questions that you can inspire with us with if you've learnt a new language. So what does this mean for our well-being? So some of you might feel that trauma is quite a strong word and you know it certainly can be but in terms of what's happened at the moment there's been a huge change in terms of our level of control uh, over many aspects of our life and a huge level of uncertainty as well. So we went from this normal life to a, a high level of uncertainty. And psychological stress is very closely related to having a loss of a sense of control and having this uncertainty. And in cases where, as pretty much all of us have to do, we have to continue to act confident and competent. 
and sort of carry on and doing our jobs and largely certainly to our students, perhaps to our colleagues, perhaps to our, perhaps to our bosses, pretend that you know, nothing um, is really happening, nothing's really wrong. And that in itself can be a recipe for you know, stress and for anxiety and for trauma. And for anyone who was previously experiencing uh, any kind of mental health uh, disorder before, and then the situation that we're facing is likely to increase that uh, significantly. So how do we deal with this situation? How do we maintain our well-being? So what's interesting is that during coronavirus, uh, an increase of 9% in Australians actually avoiding the news. So it's sort of like you get this overload. You know, I just can't actually deal with this anymore. And when we're doing online meetings, I've added a link at the end uh, that you can read in a bit more detail if you're interested. All of the natural and normal aspects of human communication are taken away. So if I was presenting a room to you, I would be able to see all of your faces. I would be able to see uh, you know, how you were responding. Um, and we could have side conversations. We can still listen to the speaker and we can notice the body language of other people in the room. And most of the body language is taken away online. So our brain actually has to work really, really hard to try and concentrate and to try and pick up these additional signals and to understand what's going on, aside from the fact that we're dealing with, you know, staring at giant heads all day and staring at our own head, which most of us don't really like doing. So what happens is that our cognitive load actually gets increased and it's very tiring. And I've talked to many academics in the last few weeks who've said, you know, I can teach for hours standing up and, you know, I sit down and I do a two hour class on Zoom or Blackboard and I feel exhausted and I don't understand why I'm so exhausted. And, and another aspect is that we're just sitting at our desk often all day and, you know, then we jump into a Zoom meeting and then we keep working and we don't necessarily take those breaks. If we were in the office, we would be walking to a different room, we'd be catching up with people on getting a coffee and doing all these things that help to re-energize us. And so one thing that's really important to do, and you know, you've heard that a lot, is actually to take breaks and make sure that you're not just sitting at your desk all day and then jumping into lots of different meetings. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of the tips at the end. And some of us are restless and tired. We're maybe sick of being in our house. We've started talking to our dog. Um, maybe we've got a lot of other people in our house. And they're, you know, that's affecting our approach as well and, and how we're actually feeling in terms of what's going on. So do we actually need to meet? The first thing I would say is obviously with our classes, you know, we don't really have any choice. So that's, you know, a high level of priority. But if we put that aside and then look at the other things that are happening in our day, sometimes I think there's an overreaction at the moment because we're isolated to connect. So we must get on Teams, you know, every five minutes, we must get on Zoom and use the camera. And, you know, it's very, very draining for people. So firstly, do we actually need to meet? I would try to reduce the number of meetings in general and video meetings where you can. Can you just share a document and make detailed comments on that document? Um, sometimes the phone is actually better. You only have to concentrate on one voice. You can also get up and walk around when you're on the phone and walking is helpful for creativity. And you know, it's pretty difficult unless you're doing a Zoom meeting on your phone um, to get up and walk around you know, while you're doing that. So try to reduce the amount of video that we're actually doing. Uh, and use the phone instead. Taking breaks regularly is so important, drinking water, all the simple things, but you know, it's easy to get halfway through your day or worse and think, gosh, I haven't eaten much, I haven't drunk much, I've been sitting in this chair for hours doing these meetings, trying to prepare my classes, um, and that's not really good for anyone. So trying to get outside in nature, uh, you know, really taking those steps to uh, you know, be, have some kind of normality in our routine, the things that we would normally do uh, to re-energise yeah, us. And I think importantly, not feeling the pressure to be or do something that everybody else says that you should do. So a lot of psychologists have talked recently about, you know, don't force being resilient right now. You know, if you aren't feeling resilient, you know, that's okay. And whilst you might not be able to share that with your students or your boss, it's really important to have uh, someone else that you can talk to or another outlet 
that you are able to kind of download these feelings and you know what you're actually going through and that's easy to forget about when we're all really busy and it's also sometimes harder to do uh, when we're doing these video meetings and we haven't been able to meet face to face so much. Uh, someone I was talking to the other day said um, I'm not doing online video social things because we actually feel this sadness. It's a sense of loss. We can see these people that we really like and that we want to be with and kind of exacerbates the fact that we can't actually um, be with them. So it's, it's a lot of extra effort mentally um, and emotionally to present online and we shouldn't kind of ignore the, the toll that that does take. So focus on what makes you feel physically and mentally comfortable whether that's getting cups of tea, having snacks, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is, just do what makes you comfortable. If you're wearing a nice business shirt on the top and then you're wearing um, track suits and slippers underneath, great, you know, do what is actually gonna work for you during what is quite a challenging time. So I put a link in there, a little bit further reading if you're interested about uh, online meetings and, and some of the aspects and what we can do to help. And I'm super conscious of not, um, going over time so i'm going to stop sharing now and, and hand back to chris okay thank you very much libby excellent um yeah it's uh it reminds me how exhausted i felt this week this is our first week of teaching back at bond for our may semester um and i spent on wednesday eight hours online um started starting at nine in the morning until five i had about a half an hour break in between um Two of those were teaching sessions and one of them was a lunchtime um, administrative meeting. So um, I felt um, probably about as tired at the end of that day as I did after like a whole week's worth of teaching um, otherwise. So anyway, uh, not to use this as an opportunity to vent, but um, I, you know, what Libby was just referring to really uh, hits close to home. Okay, I'd like to uh, now invite um, Deb Barnstone to turn on her mic and share her screen and off we go Deb. And thanks again, Libby. Hi, um, give me one second to get this up and running. And there we go. Um, thank you, Mohammed and Chris for having me. I'm going to be as fast as I possibly can, uh, mindful of the 15 minutes. And thanks to everybody who's joined us today. I thought that it might be interesting to consider how the COVID-19 crisis is affecting higher education in broad terms. And I chose to use the word impact rather than cost um, because I do believe that they're both negative and positive aspects to the changes that we've had to make in order to respond to the crisis. I should also add that this is not a definitive list um, but rather should be seen as a provocation to deeper consideration and debate. February 1st, 2020 will loom large in the Australian university sector's collective memory. This was the day that Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that he was closing the country's borders to travelers from China. There would be no exceptions. With the huge numbers of Chinese students due to return to Australia in February for the start of our autumn term, and the inordinate financial dependence that our sector has on full fee paying foreign students, universities were terrified of what was to come. To put this in context, um, particularly for our international guests, the Australian government accounted for 85% of university funding in 1980, but only covers 30% today. Cuts to the sector were pursued by both, political, by both political parties as people saw the opportunity to grow the sector while weaning it of public support. Since 2008, international student income from tuition alone has increased steadily from 15.5% of the total to 26.1% in 2018 and even more in 2020. At the same time, the percentage of Australians attending university increased from 15.7% to over 27%. But because those students are not full fee paying, their tuition accounts for relatively small portion of total income and running costs. Today, there are supposed to be over 440,000 international students in Australian higher education, injecting over $32 billion into the universities and then more into the general economy. 
but about 75,000 students have not re-enrolled. And you can see here a comparison of the data from um, 2019 in December and 2020 um, March. So there are several kinds of costs and opportunities that I'd like to briefly speak about. Some easier measured than others. And I will divide these into three categories. First, the economic impact. Second, the cultural impact. And thirdly, and lastly, the educational impact. And I know that Neil will pick up on the third one and offer you some probably very different insights. But before I start to detail some of the costs and benefits, I thought I'd share an interesting factoid that's been making the rounds on the internet. In 1665, Cambridge University closed because of the bubonic plague. So Isaac Newton decided to work from home. He would completed his degree, but was pursuing an academic career, which had to be put on hold. It's interesting to note that during this two year break, he discovered the principles of gravity, optics, and the calculus. So there is opportunity in a pandemic, not just cost. First, um, the economic impact. Australia punches way above its weight in the area of international education. It is second only to the United States in numbers of foreign students studying in its universities, in spite of the fact that we have less than one-tenth the population. The percentage of foreign students varies from two to 40%, um, with the group of eight universities most exposed. Projected losses in the sector from tuition alone this year equal $4.6 billion or more. Universities are not sure what will happen in the second semester, and there are all sorts of hidden costs from moving online and teaching remotely that weren't anticipated or budgeted for, like equipment to support staff and students working from home, relief funds for students and hard hit, hit staff, and new software. Costs to universities are the billions in income that go way beyond lost tuition and include things like lost fees for accommodation, fees for special services, memberships in gyms and clubs, um, but also more widely to the Australian economy, by some estimates, as much as $66.4 billion, which means that the effects in the broader economy are going to be tremendous. The loss of this income to universities is already resulting in cuts to capital projects on campus, which may save jobs at the universities, but means job losses outside of the university to the construction and architecture industries. Employees are being made redundant in some of the hardest hit universities, which will have knock on effects in their communities as they tighten their belts. Discretionary funding has been totally cut in most places, which affects our ability to participate in higher education at home, but also worldwide. And that of course affects our ability to participate in research and other kinds of partnerships. There's also less funding available for higher degree by research students, um, PhD and master's students, because so much of the research environment has been funded through international student fees, but also because research project funding is disappearing and grants often have funding for students tied to them. And I also know from colleagues that research funds, even ones that have been approved, are disappearing as the stock market wipes out endowments um, and discretionary income for many businesses. Universities Australia is predicting potentially as many as 21,000 redundancies nationwide just because of lost income in research. There are also cuts to purchases for libraries, which we know will affect the publishing and book selling industries. And we've also become far more aware of the waste of university space, which in many cases is prime real estate. This has always been an issue, especially in the traditional university model, where universities largely shut down and stop teaching from th for three to four months during the summer. Um, but it is even more apparent now with university campuses basically empty of students and staff. And all of this does not take into account the possible effects on young people's futures. No one knows for sure 
But past economic downturns hit the youngest hardest, recent graduates and those near graduation. The generation that graduated dur during or near the GFC earns less, and according to research data, will likely never catch up. Over 13% of young people are now unemployed, compared with about 5% three months ago, and many of those service sector jobs will be the last to return. A recent ABC article wrote that COVID-19 is widening the intergenerational wealth divide because it will saddle the youth of our country with the costs of the lockdown as repayment of government borrowing to soften the blow of COVID-19 is stretched for years to come. Positive impacts? Perhaps this will be the catalyst for weaning Australian higher education from so much dependence on foreign student income. That, of course, will necessitate rethinking the funding models for the future and some truly creative thinking, since this model was created to close the gaps caused by cuts in federal funding. Today, my vice chancellor suggested that there'll be increased state support, which could be an interesting new model for us. Um, we also need to make a better case for our value to society. In the pandemic, university trained and, um, ec and university based experts were suddenly valuable again. And we will be key to any economic pivots that the country has to make. Perhaps this will put pressure on government to create better tax incentives for industry and private individuals to, to collaborate with universities and invest in research. And perhaps this will also convince our universities that they need to provide far better structures to support academics in their research and in their attempts to find alternative funding sources. As to the financial impact on the young, Australia has implemented policies to help ensure that the economic downturn won't harm them in the way that others historically have. And with a highly educated workforce, generally, we should be relatively well poised to bounce back. But of course, the jury is still out. Cultural impact. The negative impact on university culture originates in the fact that we are online and not physically together on campus, which means, of course, as um, Libby has already said, no vibrant campus life, no chance encounters with new people, no serendipitous exchange of ideas in the corridors, the kinds of things that we know are the lifeblood of innovation and support good research as well as good teaching. The very real isolation means that all sorts of activities no longer occur, like coffee breaks, lunchtime catch-ups, study groups, live debating, live lectures, book launches, exhibitions, symposia, conferences, clubs, sports, and worst of all for us in Australia, no cocktail hours. These are all the activities that enrich the culture of the university and the education itself. And though in intangible, the creation of a social context for learning aids in all sorts of ways, from helping develop institutional loyalty to lifelong friendships, to mentorships um, and research partnerships that are particularly useful in interdisciplinary areas where collaboration needs to occur in order to tackle so-called wicked problems. And positive impacts? We've expanded the ways in which we do things to be more inclusive. Student recruitment is now taking place wholly online, which means that it's accessible to almost anyone anywhere in the world. The marketing of our programs may improve as well, because it has to, as competition for those international students becomes fiercer on world markets, and equally for those domestic students. Another improvement would be better support systems for the international students who do come. I was appalled to discover that there's no such thing in most Australian universities, no guaranteed dorm spots for exchange students or other internationals that are largely left on their own. Other positives, we now run our lecture series and exhibitions as online events like this webinar, which means that we can have colleagues from anywhere in the world participate at no cost. And this has greatly enriched our activities in a way that perhaps no one could have imagined. 
Another benefit of the new online culture, the conferences and symposia that are now being held either partially or totally online, which allows international collaborations in a way that was, I would say, more rare before the COVID-19 era. So we're all becoming used to Zoom and seeing its benefits. And that could be a fantastic thing as we move forward. Educational impact, very briefly. In the same way that online and remote activities have affected university culture, they affect teaching and learning. As Libby already said, the lack of human contact, which can promote greater exchange of ideas, peer-to-peer -peer help and collaboration, and which accelerates some kinds of learning, is now largely lacking. Face-to-face -face communication is often clearer and easier as a, as a means of communication because seeing people only on screen erases the ability to see facial cues, which are so critical to fully understanding verbal communications. The sense of social isolation experienced by all of us has also been for some oppressive, even debilitating, and that's especially dangerous for people who already have underlying mental health issues. And the screen exhaustion that Libby uh, mentioned is a very real problem. We're also finding that we need to devote much more time to teaching online person, which is an interesting thing that I don't know that any of us anticipated. Positive impact, very quickly. Um, students can learn more independently and tailor their learning to their pace, their schedule, and their habits. Research suggests that if we adjust the subject materials accordingly, this could lead to, be lead to better learning. The switch has also forced academics to engage more with digital tools and be creative with them. And some excellent ways of using those tools are emerging that could um, in future complement face-to-face learning. We now see that we can teach from anywhere, which allows us, I think, to consider recruiting students from farther afield and to imagine more flexible ways of content delivery for the future without jeopardizing the face-to-face -face model. I don't think that we would ever want to fully replace the campus experience, but the pandemic has opened up possibilities for other models and demonstrated to academics who are notoriously averse to changing their ways that there might be some new ways of using online technology to improve what we already do and do well. And experience has shown once again how adaptive human beings are and suggests that the future might hold some unforeseen promise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. That was excellent. And um, we'll move on to our third speaker, Neil Selman. Um, just wanted to, while Neil's getting set up, I'll just mention too, we had a comment from um, Donald Bates, who's the, um, the chair of the architecture program at uh, the University of Melbourne, who mentioned that one of the savings that universities are making at the moment is um, uh, in the area of, kind of facilities, uh, facilities cost, heating, cooling, printing, data, et cetera. And I know that that um, does make a, a sizable um, a sizable difference. And I suppose that means that those costs are being offset onto you know, students and staff and so forth who are paying for those things indirectly and, um, um, and in a distributed fashion. So interesting to consider how that, um, that does create this sort of shift and what that means for um, uh, facilities managers at universities as well. Okay, so Neil's got his screen share up and running, so I will uh, turn things over to you. Oh, great, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. I've had microphone issues all day. So it's lovely to be here. Um, I guess the theme of my little presentation was just online learning as a double-edged sword. Um, there's a long history of talking about online learning in education research, but only for the last couple of months have we been talking about the COVID flavor of online learning. And I think there's a lot of the same issues that we've known for a long time about online learning, but they're also slightly different. So I don't think this is a new normal or business as usual, but I think that we are entering a period of intense upheaval. And I think um, entering into a form of technology use in education, which kind of masks a, a, a kind of attempt for increased corporate reform of universities. So I guess my main point of the talk is I want to see online learning as a matter of politics. These aren't neutral tools. If you are going to adopt anything like Zoom or Moodle or any form of online learning, it's a value judgment. 
and in particular it's a value judgment about what we think higher education is and what we want higher education to be so i want to kind of provoke you up to think about online learning as a struggle as contestable as a site of dissensus so i guess the covid situation has kind of thrown up a couple of tensions on the one hand online learning has proven to be a really neat stopgap it's got us through some very difficult times and it will get us through some more difficult months but i think we're now reaching a really serious tipping point where we could be moving into profoundly online higher education and for that that kind of raises two contrasting takes some people see that as an opportunity so a lot of people in their tech are talking about a silver lining to covid or the genie being out of the bottle this being a wonderful experiment and there's people on the other side who see this as a threat. These are the same technologies being talked about, but very different readings. But I don't think it's an inevitable choice that we have to pivot over to online methods. I think we need to discuss this. So there's heaps of things I could talk about, but I just wanted to go through six issues that I think are, are ripe for discussion. And the first of all is this idea of platformatization. We're moving on to platforms in higher education in a way that we haven't seen before. Now we live in a platform society. We're very used to Google, Amazon, Facebook, we want to be transported, we rely on Uber. If we want to stay somewhere, we rely on Airbnb. And these platforms are intermediaries now that we're very used to dealing with. And they're platforms that bring together customers and service providers, content producers and advertisers for social exchange and economic interaction. So when you put that model onto the university, you can see where we're going. And the opportunity of this is that um, we can have one platform for everything, a one-size-fits-all, one-stop shop for all services, all payments, all data-related interactions. We're used to things like Moodle and Canvas being the kind of mothership for our teaching and learning, but these platforms will soon be the kind of centre for everything. And the opportunities are obvious. They're huge economies of scale, interoperability, standardisation and consistency, and you can seamlessly join up university as a student or a member of staff with the rest of your life. My university uses Facebook as our intranet workplace, and we can seamlessly link up our social Facebook and our work Facebook lives into one. Now, the threat of this, in terms of more platformatization of universities, again, I guess is, is fairly clear. Platforms completely shape your interactions. Anyone that's used Facebook or Twitter will know that you have to produce content which is platform ready. You have to make interactions that are platform compliant and it alters the nature of what you do and how you do it. Now, it's less of a problem when you're trying to write a 280 character message. But when you're teaching and learning, having a platform guiding what you do completely shapes your pedagogy. But also raises issues of reconfigurations of power, both inside and outside the organisation. Power being moved to the platform, um, kind of of the, 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 the commercial player that's making the platform and also in terms of um, hierarchies within the universities raises clear questions of monopoly regulation and privacy but also in terms of profitability these platforms are never free the product of these platforms is always data i mean uber doesn't actually exist to run a taxi firm it's a data generating firm and again if we're bringing higher education into the data economy there are questions to be asked here and also the nature of platform work Platform work is on demand, outsourced and precarious, it's gig work in, in other words. And the platformatized university raises the changing nature of academic work as well. We'll be 24 seven and very, very replaceable. This idea of personalization is another one of buzzwords in ed tech and technology more general. When, when we live in a world of curated playlists, we're recommended items and targeted advertising. And there's a clear appetite for the, the Netflixing of higher education. Um, bringing all those kind of characteristics to bear on universities. And in education, the opportunities are seen to be great. We can use these personalized technologies to tailor learning experiences to the specific needs of the individual student. So you see things like adaptive curricula, adaptive testing, recommender systems, um, and the opportunities there are for self-directed learning, self-regulated learning, and more student-centered delivery. But the flip side, um, the threat on the other hand, I think is much, much more important. The key question I think to ask about technology is what is being lost as well as what is being gained. And in terms of the increased personalization of higher education through technology, we're losing the value of the common experience. There's a collective experience of learning together. There's value in the common curriculum, the Copernicus quote, you don't know what you don't know. Being told what you need to learn is often very, very useful. And this whole idea about changing education into a kind of choose your own adventure runs the risk of students going down very narrow paths entering kind of filter bubbles 
about what they learn, how they learn, who they learn it with. And the, the big beef I have with personalization is the inequitability of it. By placing great onus on the student to make sense of things and make and progress successfully, there's a self responsabilization of success, but there's also a self responsabilization of risk. Some, st some students need structure and guidance and direction. And so personalization might be seen to kind of increase in the equality of opportunity, but less so in equality of outcome. So we've talked a little bit about flexibilities of time and space, this idea of online learning being any time, any place, any pace. Sounds really attractive and it fits with this idea of the digital nomad, you know, being agile and being nimble, using technologies that are both synchronous and asynchronous, that are multi-sited and mobile. And the opportunities are seen to be that this is what students want. It's a kind of demand side, not supply side way of organizing education. But again, I think the threats here are need, need considering. I mean, the material still matters. You don't just learn in a, in a virtual space. Online learning doesn't just take place nowhere. It takes place in the home or on the move. And we've seen from COVID-19 how the shift to learning at home has highlighted the diversity and the constraints of the home as a site for education. Learning and working and living at home is not so good for people's mental health, for people who are in caring um, roles, those who are in abusive relationships, or just those who are in a house with five people fighting for Wi-Fi connections. Learning at home outsources the cost to students and to staff. This is the point that was being made about photocopying and electricity. And some students, again, need structure and guidance and direction, and they value coming onto campus. Um, we were talking to some students about why they still come to face-to-face -to -face lectures when they're streamed live and they were saying we're not going to learn unless we come here for an hour and just sit here and learn coming to uni is a bit like coming to the gym and you do it and you suck it up which is an interesting way of thinking about things and that's lost if um, everything gets outsourced and, and off-sited and again online learning works for a certain type of person what Tressie McMillan Cotton calls the roaming autodidact but again doesn't work for others and so there are issues of um, the quality of um, outcome here that really worry me. Data is a big thing and we know this about technology use in education and there are great enthusiasms for how data might be used in online learning, how we can use trace data from learning management systems and effective monitoring and this idea of learning analytics and getting a real-time picture of the student and what they're doing and again this is very seductive there are great opportunities here as far as university managers and leaders are concerned you know uh, there's a famous kind of industry boast that you can have a million data points and know any student better than their teacher can. But again, there are all the broad concerns about the increased quantification and metric metri metrification of, of education and all of the issues of performativity, re representativeness and what is, what is reduced in measuring everything and turning everything into statistics that really, really worry me. And also this idea about how data can be used for data valence, surveillance through data, monitoring and control, as well as just guiding and supporting. Just last couple of points that I think are worth thinking about. There's great um, enthusiasm for online technologies that allow people to um, automate lots of stages of, of the teaching and learning process. There are a lot of technologies now from verifying student identities through facial recognition, through to chatbots and even automated essay grading. And the opportunity here is that it takes away the drudge work and the heavy lifting of teaching, frees teachers up to actually get involved in, in real pedagogic work. And so the, the idea is that it assists um, rather than replaces the teacher. And educational work can get done at a very consistent, reliable and fast um, kind of level that it wouldn't get done before. But again, there are really, really worries here about the pedagogical work that gets lost as soon as you take away what seemed to be drudge work. Grading essays, you could argue, is a really important pedagogical task for teachers. So is giving advice. This automation is only as good as the sets. And the systems are only good as the algorithms are programmed to be. And there is a big, big concern here that automated education um, systems will deprofessionalize teachers. Teachers will be reduced to kind of just sitting at the side and responding to the decisions the technologies make rather than using the technologies to guide their own decisions. So my concern here is that it's not that there's going to be less work, but there's going to be worse work. And I guess the big elephant in the ring to all of this is what I've termed commercial know-how, but I'm really interested in the way that technology industry is actually kind of getting involved. And I'm not, I don't want to knock commercial involvement um, wholesale, we need the tech to build the technologies that we use. Um, and it's great that big companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft are taking an interest in education. And there's a lot of commercial know-how and you know, opportunities to think differently and maybe break the monopoly of the university. 
But the threat here is, is obvious. I mean, these commercial companies, are underlying, their underlying motivation is to profit. We need to be careful. Um, so in terms of online learning, firms are now getting involved in higher education pivot uh, to online learning because there's big money involved. In the US, by 2025, we're looking at $130 billion market. And there's little obligation for these firms to stick around if things get messy. And there's a tendency to pivot. And the Silicon Valley mantra of moving fast and breaking things applies here. Um, and it's really important to look at the political economy of all of this. There are big commercial forces gathering in the wake of COVID-19 to push universities over to online modes of learning. Um, and there's a large scale industry lobby that's now mobilizing itself and really pushing this. So it's not the pandemic that's driving interest in pivoting to online learning, it's, it's profit. And so we've got companies like Pearson all the way through to very small, smaller kind of edupreneurs who are reimagining what education is, but they tend to vastly underestimate the complexity of education, get frustrated by it, and ultimately try to reshape a higher education into a very different product, product in scare quotes. So I guess, I mean, Everything I've said is not a dichotomy. These are not black and white discussions. These are not yes or no choices. But I think when we do move over to more online and technology led ways of learning, I really want us to think about the values of what we're doing here. And values are something that we don't normally talk about in discussions of ed tech. So when you're pressed to think about moving to online learning, the main questions are not technical, but I think they're value driven. What type of architecture education do you want? And what has been amplified in these technologies, but also what is being lost? And just to finish off with, I'm really interested in how things might be otherwise. Everything I've kind of painted seems very kind of doom and gloom, but there are alternative ways of thinking about technology that are not usually talked about in education, human-centered approaches. So if you're interested in thinking differently about how you might teach online and work online, there's some great examples. The Edinburgh University Manifesto for Online Teaching, for example, gives you a completely different humanistic approach to how you might teach online. The Hybrid Pedagogy Collective or the FemTech net network gives you a whole idea about how values of care and empathy and restraint can actually be baked into the way that we use these technologies these technologies are not inherently evil they can they're great to to work with but we want to use them at our own on our own kind of agenda and on our own terms and so i really think we need to think as an academy about ed tech as a political matter and push back where we're not happy excellent thank you very much neil that was fascinating. And yeah, if I can ask the, uh, the panelists to now, I'll turn on their videos and mics. And what we can do at this stage is to shift into a, um, a bit of a discussion. So if we have um, any of our attendees who have joined the webinar today that, that do want to ask a question, um, I might just start by saying, uh, Neil, I've never heard someone, um, let's say, apply uh, the word Netflix now as a verb, so Netflixing. Um, that's the first time I've heard that one. Um, so well done if you coined that phrase. Um, I suppose it's a lot in the same way that we use uh, Googling as a, as a verb now, which we um, you know, didn't uh, 15 or so years ago. Um, I will just uh, maybe just pick up on uh, one of the initial comments that came through um, uh, from Frasso in, in London, which was directed at um, Libby and Deb, which was about um, addressing some of the negatives, which I, I think is speaking to um, the loss of some of the cultural or informal aspects of teaching. So the unplanned encounters, um, uh, the, the things that actually you know, do have an inherent um, impact on the quality um, of one's um, teaching and learning experience. Um, Libby, do you want to go first? Or? I'm happy for you to Deborah, and then I can jump in after. <laughs> um, Fr uh, Frasso, I, um, I have to say that I don't think, uh, not just to Frasso, but to everyone, that I personally don't believe there's any replacement for face-to-face -face teaching because there's so many things that happen when you're in front of another human being that you simply cannot um, replicate online. Having said that, I, I do think um, in the same way that Libby was, was giving people suggestions for um, keeping their sanity <laughs> during this period, that there are also ways that we can at least um, improve uh, some of the negatives about this um, platform, if you will, this way, way of working. Um, one of the things that I find is far more effective if I'm going to meet with a group, a small group is going to work a lot better than trying to lecture to 200 students online 
And um, little things like, so, so next semester, I will not be giving a, a typical history lecture. I'm canceling the lecture and we're gonna do everything in a very different way. Um, another thing that I think really helps a lot is a very simple little thing to ask students to check in with them, how are you? And give them a second before the class begins um, to say how they feel because um, not only does that humanize the relationship between teacher and student, but it, it also sets it up um, in a way that you might relate when you're face to face. Um, we need to be a little more conscious of those little niceties that get lost, I think, in the screen relationship. Yeah, absolutely agree, Deborah. Um, a couple of things I would add. So the first one would be in relation to uh, the content delivery and some other platforms. So I don't give live lectures online because I think I would hate to listen to myself for any length of time just doing PowerPoint. So I pre-record them in no longer than seven minute chunks and then give them activities. And I'm sure you're all kind of doing that um, already. And then um, using the class just to be much more live and human, as you said, Deborah. And I use Yammer as an online community for the students that is kind of always on and always engaged. And so they do kind of peer-to-peer -peer sharing and learning on there. And I find that they seem to really like that, to feel that there's sort of a live effect there. But then on the other side, I think I do a class on um, change management and one of the projects each semester is um, identifying a, a personal issue that they'd like to change to learn about how difficult change is. And I'm horrified every year, every time the class is on, uh, I'd say 30 to 40% of the undergrads select a mental health issue for their project, that they have social anxiety, that they don't sleep. Um, and so, I think we know that for people who do have social anxiety or who have other um, challenges in terms of learning with other people, that online learning can be easier for them. And yeah, as the generations are coming through, you know, they, they're very comfortable with doing stuff in the chat and then, you know, talking online. And so, you know, this week I found, you know, it's been quite encouraging to see the students feel comfortable to just, you know, keep sharing in the chat and and then starting to talk as more people talk, which they often don't do as much in class, especially early on. So I think, um, yeah, I find Yammer works really well and then just having the whole class live on interaction and activities and case study analysis or, or whatever it is um, and letting them do the, the heavy lifting of, of, offline. Great, thanks, Libby and Deb. Um, I just wanted to then field, there's a question here from, um, from Don Bates as well, speaking about, um, uh, I guess, if a reaction to our current setting is that, um, you know, it feels quite difficult and quite challenging and is, well, his question, I guess, is around, um, is what we're trying to, to do in, at this stage is to figure out ways to make things easier once again. Um, and maybe that uh, what comes at a cost in that pursuit is, um, not really looking at what the what the learning opportunities are that come through um, persevering um, through the challenges that these kind of shifts demand of us. Um, I wonder, Neil, is that a question that you might be interested in responding to? Yeah, I mean, lots of these discussions about technology use are actually about higher education um, in general. So, I mean, we're entering a period now where universities are going to be trying to save millions, if not billions of dollars. And it's all about making things easy and efficient and cost saving. And I guess if those are the criteria that um, education leaders are following, then we, I think as faculty, we have to make a real strong case for our own existence. Um, and we can appeal to you know, the idea of critical thinking or, or pedagogic um, tenets, but we really need to make a strong case um, that pushes back against this idea of saving money, making things more efficient. And so it's not really a question of technology as such, it's just a question of, of higher education in general. And just coming back on a couple of the points to the earlier questions, one of the, the, the obvious things to say is, well, there's value to a human teacher or an expert human teacher. But I think we need to be much sharper in that because that argument isn't going to really wash if they're trying to save $350 million in each university. So what is it about human education or critical education or being in the room that we really think is worth the, the extra money and the extra cost? I agree with everyone. I think it, it is. But we really need to have a kind of good pushback because otherwise the economic agenda and the efficiency agenda is going to win out. Can I, add, oh, yeah, please, I want to add something to Don's comment because um, what, what he's talking about is, I think, a trend that has been worldwide in higher education now for at least 30 years. I think about Jane Smiley's humorous 
um, novel of over 20 years ago, Moo, that was already talking about these issues, making things easier, treating the students like customers. And most of us um, would agree that that's not what we should be doing, but what we should be concerned about is how to be, how to be better conveyors of knowledge, how to challenge our students better and engage them um, better, not easier, but better. I, because I certainly have seen a shift in the 30 years that I've been an academic from, um, and, and also I think because I've taught in places that were different from where I studied, a culture around learning that's really changed that I think you know we're constantly struggling with, which is um, how to help students understand that learning isn't about things being easy, it's about challenging your mind and expanding your mind, and sometimes that means you fail, you know? <laughs> so um, the online piece then um, doesn't, the online piece is simply another challenge for us as educators, um, another thing that's making it, let's say, uh, more difficult to do the things that, that we think we need to do, if that makes sense. No, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Devin. I mean, related to that, um, I guess one of the things I was thinking about was the, the kind of um, the push and pull that uh, at least architecture education has with the profession and the kind of demands and expectations that the profession places on graduates and, and vice versa. And I suppose one of the things that, you know, we are seeing more and more are the kind of the global offices and the way that um, work is becoming distributed. Um, and that actually working in the cloud is is really a, a thing now. And, and and maybe Libby, you could also speak to this in the sense that um, the, the personalization, I guess, that Neil was talking about, I mean, where students might demand and expect a certain kind of um, personalization of their study, um, an accreditation body might expect something that's still very rigorous. And, and I also suppose the, the, the workplace, um, depending on what sort of, you know, industry it's in, um, having students that have graduated from an experience of interpersonal collaboration in the classroom that prepares them for a certain kind of um, success for, or capability in the workplace after graduating, um, you know, those, um, those workplaces might feel, you know, inheriting graduates that come from an online learning um, background aren't as adept and that has certain kinds of compromises as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting because outside of academia, the trend has been happening for quite a while in terms of personalization of the whole work experience and companies, you know, targeting talent based on the ability to offer them this personalized, you know, human centered experience. And, you know, more and more people are saying, I want that, you know, I want to be able to do X and then go and play netball in the middle of the morning or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, we've seen obviously Twitter come out and say their staff can keep working at home forever. So, you know, on the one hand, I think it will be less of an issue if people turn up and they're really good talent and they say, I want to work from home. I think the downside is, is things that are all of the um, panelists have mentioned that, you know, what we lose in terms of the ability to communicate face to face, you know, the things that only work effectively face to face, you know, we know remote teams still don't perform as well as face to face teams. So I think there's going to need to be a balance um, between that and, you know, we're seeing organisations send in teams on different days so that they can have that face-to-face -face time. At the moment, that's starting to happen. So, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see how it evolves, Chris. Indeed. Um, Deb, I know that we're coming up on five and you have a hard out at five o'clock. So I want to thank um, Deb Barnstone for her participation today and thanks for your insight and comments. Thanks to all of you as well. It's a fantastic panel. Yep. Thanks, Deb. Okay, so we are at five o'clock, which is meant to be our kind of cutoff time for this webinar, but um, we've got a couple more questions that have come through. And so if, um, if Neil and Libby are, are happy to help um, field a couple of these, maybe we could address these uh, couple questions and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll tie a ribbon around um, today's session. Um, so uh, I guess one that was, had come through, maybe more of a comment, but um, uh, from Lone Paulson, who um, has six years of online education experience in architecture um, already. And, um, and uh, I guess, you know, complementing the, um, the, the nature of this discussion and presentations about um, um, highlighting the, the various aspects and consequences, um, I suppose programs that were sort of pioneers in this space of going out into online learning approaches, um, you know, kind of see the rest of the world now, you know, 
catching up or grappling with the things that they've had to deal with for quite some time. Um, I know in the U.S. there's you know 105 architecture programs, or in North America, I should say, and there's five or six that offer an online degree. Um, here in Australia, New Zealand, um, really, it's, uh, Curtin has been the only one that's provided an accredited architecture degree to date. Um, so it's interesting times to now see how we're you know, converging with, with some of those other programs. Um, there was a, an earlier question that came through on the chat, um, Neil, which I think it was directed um, at you from, um, from Mohammed Maki. Um, just scrolling back to it now. Sorry. Um, some are questioning whether we need a full return to face-to-face -to -face after the pandemic. And I guess I'll also just use that as a good segue to mention that our next um, WSA webinar is actually about that question of the transition from online back to face-to-face -face, um, and what the nature of that might be. Um, and so that we keep some elements online. And his question being that, does this fit into that lobbying by the big tech? And what can we make sure that the decisions about making those moves towards um, keeping some things online versus returning to face-to-face -to -face, um, might be driven by the right proponents? Yeah, it's interesting. The the kind of urgency for a full return is um, if you look at uh, US in particular, there's some really interesting architectural decisions being made about how to get everyone back on campus purely to make money, I guess. Um, I've seen, um, I heard you were talking about having plexiglass um, protection for uh, vulnerable lecturers. So they could still stand in a lecture theatre and do their job. Um, they're talking about outside teaching. There's all sorts of panics for a full return that are not driven for pedagogical reasons. I think the lobby push is for blended learning in the first instance. There are some great elements. Why don't we keep teaching the classes, you know, and, and keep what's being been useful. So I can see Zoom being a very big educational player from now on where we hadn't previously heard of it. And I think the lobby are quite happy for a kind of gradual push over to blended. Um, and in some ways, I think, as Mohammed says, there have been things which have been useful. It, it's actually quite good to have online first seminars like this in terms of widening the audience, uh, even though we do lose a bit of the bandwidth. So I think we need to make a kind of case for keeping the technology that works for us. Um, but, uh, to be cynical, I think if I want to make a play for keeping a, a campus and professors in, in real life in 20 years time, maybe the international market is the way to do it. I mean, we were talking before about the kind of international student numbers falling off a cliff, but international students want to come to campus face to face. They want to see real life professors and see a campus and, you know, live in a different country. And I, hopefully we can maybe leverage that as proof, uh, a kind of a reason for our own existence in 10, 20 years time. Because if you look at it, there's no reason why we can't have online degrees for most subject areas. I, mean, I, would, I can't really see how you can learn to be an architect fully online or a surgeon or a musician. But for me, the social sciences and the humanities, I, you know, I, the pessimistic side of me sees there's no real case to be made for staying um, face to face unless we really, really speak up. So long story short, blended is what everyone's asking for at the moment, but it could easily tip over into fully online uh, in a few years after that. Yeah, watch, watch this space, I suppose. Um, just related to that, um, one last question that's come up in the Q&A um, panel was also about um, newer technologies like VR um, and those being used as in collaborative online teaching and learning. Um, so I haven't had any direct experience with that. I think one of the issues, um, because we do have a, a VR and AR subject in the architectural program at, um, where I teach, um, which is actually a new subject, and one of the issues with that is um, demonstration equipment that you would otherwise use in a classroom um, is hard to distribute because it's expensive and, and so forth. So like a, an Oculus, Oculus Rift headset um, and whatnot, you know, becomes a bit of a limitation if you need to somehow get that in the hands of a multitude of students. So teaching things like VR seem like they have to be done maybe by more of a proxy um, or a sort of, you know, simulated VR environment that you can still look at on a desktop screen. Um, but, you know, maybe there's also a panacea of being able to all virtually inhabit, you know, a, a collaborative teaching space as a set of avatars and so on, um, which is something that we did look at in the, uh, the second ASA webinar, um, the example of using Mozilla Hubs as a, a kind of a gallery space that people can inhabit and even pin up and, and look at their work and uh, work at simultaneously. Um, and I'm just going to scroll down through the chat and just see if we have... Um, thanks for that question, Terry, by the way. Um, looks like we have a few sort of exit questions. Um, Mel Melanie Bell-Smith um, from Sydney um, asking about teaching uh, professional practice. Um, 
from her office that she could spontaneously pull in documents, et cetera. Um, so that kind of convergence or collapse of the professional space and the teaching space, actually having some positive serendipity, um, yeah, which would seem to make a lot of sense. Um, but also her comment is a, a, agreeing that blended learning has uh, its limitations and is exhausting um, indeed. Um, and then a final comment around the financial ethics um, of big institutions needing to be challenged, if anybody has a take on that. And then there's a final question also about uh, the trauma of educators uh, ex that are that educators are experiencing and the costs that come is, and are those some uh, an actual liability to the institution by basically you know forcing or um, requiring um, academics to teach um, in this particular way? So there's a couple questions there. Um, one about the financial ethics and one about um, uh, the educator's experience. Well, the question of financial ethics, again, is a, a much bigger question than ed tech. Um, and yes, I agree. We need to kind of challenge the financial ethics of big institutions, but also big institutions employ me. So I want to keep, keep in a job. I would say that technology procurement, though, could be reframed as a political issue. Um, we're seeing protests at the moment in some universities because universities are taking on board online um, virtual examination proctoring where students are monitored by facial recognition cameras and they can take examinations in their own homes. And that's seen to be ethically um, a little bit dubious and there is pushback there. And then some universities are rolling back. So I think we need to see the adoption of any new technology as a, as a kind of in a political terms. And if we don't like the look of it, if we don't really think it's educationally beneficial or ethically and ethically um, right, then we can push back. Um, but at the moment, we see technology as a kind of neutral tool, um, and it's not a neutral tool at all. Um, but I'll, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be the first person in line to challenge the financial ethics of my institution at the moment because I've just looked online and I think we're. Right, yeah, I think they're talking about millions of dollars. So um, yeah, it's, it's a big, big question, but technology issues are, are much bigger than just the technology. I think that's the main point. Great, thanks, Neil. And Libby, did you want to speak to that last question? Yeah, absolutely. We might um, conclude with this one, just to, for our attendees. Yeah, so obviously employers have a duty of care to provide a safe workplace for their employees. And, you know, that extends to what, wherever that workplace might be. And so this is very new territory for um, a lot of universities. Obviously that would have had some people teaching online, but those people went to campus or they had a limited number of people doing it from home. And now it's you know everyone at the moment. So I think it is an evolving situation as well. I think it was so done so quickly. There was little thought for what is the home environment like? Is it ergonomically safe? And then you've got the psychological um, aspect as well. Um, in relation to that, Mohammed. So, yeah, I think, yeah, employers have a duty of care in terms of their employees and their workplace. So I'm sure we'll see some evolving uh, scenarios regarding this. Great, thanks, Libby. All right, so with that, we've run about 10 minutes over time and um, I think we'll, we'll draw this to a close. So thank you very much um, to today's presenters, um, Neil, Libby, and Deb. Um, thanks again to Martha and Mohammed for their assistance and uh, coordinating, pulling things together. And thank you very much to our attendees. Um, it was a really excellent session. And again, you can access um, the slides and a recording of today's session from the AASA website. And I also think registered attendees will get an email to that effect. And just one final reminder as well uh, to join us for the final AASA webinar in this series, which will take place in a fortnight from today, which will focus on uh, transitions from online back to face-to-face -to -face, um, when the time comes. So thanks once again, and we will now sign off. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.